So my name is Jung Su. I'm the VP of Global Publishing for Yoda One. We're one of the largest independent publishers of mobile games in China. We're uh, consist consistently ranked in the top five by Athani on iOS. Um, let's see if we can start off by getting a rough a little bit with a little bit more energy here. No sound? Is there? Here, I'll put the mic. So that's one of our games, Ski Safari, which uh, initially started as a premium title uh, in China uh, about two years ago, and that was uh, about 35,000 downloads when it came into the global market. Today it's uh, past 75 million downloads, so I'm going to talk to you today about how we as a publisher help Defiant Development take a single player premium title and made it into a mass market success in China. So, okay. So, as I said, uh, I'm the VP of Global Publishing. Um, my background is in, I've spent four years at Electronic Arts, uh, years, two years at Activision, four years at Disney. I've had my own mobile company. Um, Yoda One is a co-production publishing uh, company based out of Beijing. We're about 200 people in Beijing, another 15 in Nanjing. We have studios in both Seoul, Korea, and uh, Tokyo, Japan, as well as in Shanghai. Um, and just to give you guys a little background uh, about the China market, I'm going to go into a few, a few uh, basic uh, rules about China. Um, so, uh, some golden rules that we kind of go by in the Chinese market. Free to play is king, no exceptions. There uh, are on very rare occasions that sometimes a premium game will do well on the app stores, but uh, at this day and age it's a very challenging uh, part of the business to do a premium title. Uh, just to give you an idea, to get to the top free-to-play spot, uh, if you were a premium title, you'd need to have about 100x uh, what you would have to do on the, on, the, on the free side just to get into the top ranking of Apple. Uh, most uh, Android stores in China, uh, of the four or 500 there are, they don't, some of them don't even do premium titles at all, so you really have to think about making a game that's a free-to-play model. Uh, and also, secondly, the most important part is that games now are live operations, meaning that, uh, I can get more into this, but you need to think about ways of making games have events, uh, uh, sweepstakes, anything that will make the game actually sustain over a longer period of time, and that's an important aspect of the free-to-play model. Third is uh, when you enter a market, and we suggest this for any market that you're going to, but particularly in China, you want to culturalize a game. So don't translate, culturalize it. Uh, meaning, it's not just about the language, uh, taking English text and turning it into. When our design teams really work on a game, what we do is we'll give the game over to our staff, and they will play through the whole game. And then they'll actually, from the ground up, uh, work with our development partners to create new game titles, uh, new art. We oftentimes work with the source code to develop whole new aspects of the game, monetization, conversion. So we work uh, quite hand in hand with all of our development partners. Um, the other piece of really important information, in particularly in China as well, is 
when you enter the play space, uh, good monetization is equal to good distribution. Um, that sounds backwards, but because in particular the Android app stores, there is no real good way to boost up the charts or monetize, you actually have to do a lot of what I call hand-to-hand -hand business development. So you are competing with a lot of other games out there in the Android app stores in China to get feature prominent spots uh, on the different app store uh, pages. So what they look for is the metrics. They want to know that your, your day one numbers, your day seven numbers, all those are doing well. They want to know that you have a good IAP framework and that monetization is strong. Uh, if those numbers aren't uh, at least competitive, then you'll find it hard to get uh, future feature placement. So uh, good monetization will give you good distribution. Uh, and lastly, um, metrics. It really matters. And I know that some purist game designers think, you know, the game is about fun, but also now, now <coughs> the, the, the metrics of a game, the, the day one numbers and the day seven numbers again, retention numbers, um, really do matter. Uh, China has about a billion gamers, 600 million devices. So if you can figure out a way to keep people in the game, once you keep them in the ecosystem, obviously it's much easier to monetize and convert them to a paying user. But unless you solve that basic problem of keeping people in the game, uh, you're going to have a really hard time monetizing the game inside of China. Um, for most people, particularly Western developers, but also you know, outside of China, the discovery distribution and payment system, all this stuff is pretty well known. Um, in China, this is all very different because discovery distribution, payment, very, very uh, complicated. This is China. Um, you don't have Google Play in China, so they don't exist. Instead, you have over 500 Android app stores that can make distribution, discovery, very challenging. They all have their own ad SDKs, their own payment structures in place, so you have to integrate a lot of that. Um, that's what makes China such a tough, tough place to be. So uh, with that in mind, um, let's talk a little bit about what we did with uh, Ski Safari. Uh, so Ski Safari was a self-published title from uh, a 12-person team out of Brisbane, Australia. I don't know how many people here have played the game or know the game. Yeah. Okay, so some of you. Um, when it came out in February 2012 worldwide, uh, it was the number one paid app in Australia. It had gotten quite a few features uh, on the iOS App Store Game of the Week. Did quite well for them. Um, the core team, obviously, two people. And uh, it was pretty much doing about 35,000 downloads in China as a premium game when it came out. So that, at that moment in time, was probably equivalent to about $69 net revenue for them. Uh, about a year later, we started working with them. They found it challenging. It was a premium title. Uh, so we did a couple of things first. Uh, we worked very closely with the guys over there, and we laid down the foundations for free to play. So we took a, a premium title with very little IP framework and made it into a free, free to play model game. Uh, one of the first things we did was give it more vanity items, um, add more consumables, and added more levels. Um, as you can start to see, we also started touching on some character art that was localized for China. Uh, this was all of the Beijing studio, so we did all this internally with all of our production partners. We work with source code, and we uh, will do the, our own art music. All the music that you heard on the previous video was all done internally at uh, Yodawan Beijing. We spent about four months working remotely with the Brisbane team and by the time we got done with it, uh, you know, we were able to fully culturalize it and, and, and go beyond just translation. So there were now at this point two versions of the game. One was the international version and one was the Chinese edition. Uh, what we tend to do with all of our art uh, engineering, any sound that we do for the culturalization of the game, we give it back to the original developer so they can use it for their international build. Um, we don't hold on to any of the content, but it is given back to the, the developer. Um, by August 2012, we had launched, um, and in December 2012, uh, we had put out the game. We'd integrated, obviously, some, some new text. Uh, we'd integrated 
a lot of the, the Chinese ad network SDKs, which at that time, there wasn't a huge uh, a network ad network at the time when we released the game. So what we had to do actually is we federated about 35 ad networks in China into a single SDK, which we then used to integrate the game. Um, back at that time, you would be looking at, uh, you know, if you had a, a million DAU game, you would crash the whole network system uh, in China. It's gotten a little bit better, but it's not nearly as sophisticated as the Western markets for the ad network. So we did a lot of integration here. Obviously, the social network is very different. There's no Facebook, there's no Twitter, so you have to localize for each of these areas inside of China. Um, so with this whole new ad network, we were doing probably about 4x the eCPMs that they were doing previously in the, in the, the last build. Uh, let's see. So with, with all this new builds here, what we got out of it was a brand new uh, culturalized phase one uh, of the game. Um, what we kind of saw was about from a 35,000 download in that whole one year cycle that Define had come out to, we were looking at about 100, 120,000 downloads a day. Um, and that was just in the first set of changes that we did. Um, we obviously were able to secure through our friends at uh, Apple uh, feature placement choice features for the iOS store. Uh, they were number one in the free apps. Um, the, the net revenue, as you can see now, changed from $69 to about $1,351, so about 21x. We averaged 62,000 downloads a day at that time over a four month period approximately. Um, the most interesting thing is at that time, we were doing about 60% of all of our revenues from ads um, through our federated network. Um, we did some minor burst promotions um, and a couple of updates. So with every update that we did, we were doing burst promotions across the board. Now, uh, as we sort of grow the product, um, you can see that total we had about 6.5 million downloads over from the launch of the product to where it is at this point. Uh, phase two, um, we started new content in March and we also added Android. So with the Android build, um, we did a full uh, new content piece called uh, Pandas Pass, which uh, is sort of the first sort of new whole world concept that the Beijing team did. We added new maps, creatures, avatar, uh, avatars, consumable, that uh, were very targeted to the Chinese gamer here. Um, and we also launched in the top 10 Chinese app stores. Uh, in the iOS store, we got about 8 million downloads in the first six months from the initial launch. And Android was tracking, tracking to about 7.5 million. Uh, what you'll notice here is now iOS is becoming almost 70% uh, ad revenue. We're downloading about 30,000 daily. Um, Android was also 50% of our, so the revenue split was about 50-50, but on Android, it was all IAP. Um, and I can go into that a little bit more in detail, but the reason why most of this was IP was in Android, we had one-click payment systems in place with the carriers. So you gotta imagine in China, most people uh, don't have credit cards still. Um, and if you are using iTunes in China, what you would have to do is you would have to bind a debit card, then log in, put funds into your iTunes Connect, then once you put that in, then you would have to go and download a 99 cent item. You gotta imagine the, the loss because of the friction there. Whereas with Android, one click carrier billing, we were able to just bill directly from the phone carrier. So that's where you see the significant increase in revenue. Um, so the real upside is on Android with a pure IP revenue. So mid-June, um, we came out with another big uh, change and this was basically a concept around Journey to the West, um, which in Asia, particularly in China, it's, it's sort of equivalent to the King Arthur fairy tale. I'm sure a lot of you know about you know, Monkey Magic and Pig Monster. Uh, you saw some of that in the video that I, I showed with the New Worlds. Um, there was a whole new level map. Uh, in fact, that because of this new world, which we gave back to Define, a lot of, uh, of local gamers, the Chinese gamers, actually thought that 
Defiant was a local Chinese company um, because the content was so so unique to that particular game. Um, we expanded distribution. Um, we added additional 10 new app stores to that. Um, and then also added preloads to phones. So we went from app stores from iOS to Android. Then we started adding preloads to new devices that were coming out into the China marketplace. Uh, that now is about 15% of our business with the preloads. So that's becoming an interesting aspect to uh, the business there. Um, you'll also uh, you know, notice that uh, we'll if uh, you notice that up here that we started adding Windows. So Windows is an interesting platform. It's growing. That's about 5% of our revenues right now. But if you remember, uh, Windows is uh, now the owner of Nokia. And Nokia for many, many years in China was probably dominated the whole feature phone market. So Nokia actually has a re relatively strong uh, brand recognition still in China. And there's an interesting place for here. Although the numbers are small, um, you know, half a million downloads, uh, they own probably up to 3 to 5% of the market. So it's a growing platform. It's an interesting place to be. Um, so at this point in time, we had our second produce expansion pack. We had this journey to the West Chinese mythology. We had all this new uh, IAP going on with monthly promotions. We're doing now promotions with the carriers and tiered app stores. So again, this hand-to-hand -hand business development that we're working with each store to get feature placement. Um, if you look at the difference now, 85% of it is on Android. iOS is now 15%. Um, this number has actually changed since dramatically, but we're now doing about 210x uh, daily revenue than when we started. Um, this number, again, has risen. It's about 75 million down. Uh, users now. Um, that's about 45 million new users in the past six months. Um, pretty much a slide there. Sorry, I'm rushing through here. I want to make sure that we're staying on track here. Um, I talked a little bit about what carrier billing is about. Um, it's frictionless payment with one click billing. Um, over 400 app stores who really use that. Um, not all app stores are born equal. Uh, there's probably 20 to 25 stores that really matter. Uh, they drive 70 to 80% of the actual volume. Um, although there's four or 500 app stores, these guys are the ones that really drive most of the revenue. Um, for most of the carry app stores, casual games convert the best. That's a predominant uh, form, although that's starting to morph and change a little bit in terms of social casual, less about the single player experience. Um, this is interesting because tier one app stores can drive massive volumes with over 600 handsets out there and the billion gamers. Um, your ARPU can be a little bit thin, but if you're monetizing across a billion people, you can imagine what the revenues can be. Um, much of the mid-core and hardcore games require custom billing because there's a lot more uh, monetization aspects to it. Um, but that is changing now as well. Um, Retention, one to seven days. Uh, again, that's a really important aspect. For most casual to some mid-course social, you want to be at, again, a 40, 45% day one retention number. That's a good, solid number to be at. And day seven, minimum, I think, 15%, optimally in the early to, to mid-20% day seven numbers. Again, keeping the people in the game system so that you can convert, convert and monetize them. Uh, next slide. So what's, what's it look like in 2014 for China Mobile uh, gaming market? Uh, everything I just talked about is changing again. <laughs> so <laughs> for 2014, I think what will be important is that there are a lot of new players coming into the marketplace, especially the big guys and the platform guys, so like the Alibaba guys and the Tencent WeChat platforms. New distribution platforms for everybody. Um, big players also. Uh, anyone with distribution for discovery? So, Soku, Yoku, um, that's Momo, Alibaba, anyone who's got footprint on both their mobile and their web facing properties, they're now trying to figure out how to monetize their foot traffic. And that is changing the dynamics 
of the marketplace. Um, we put Windows and Firefox. Uh, Firefox is interesting, uh, mainly because they are now working with people like ZTE to sell a $25 handset. So you can imagine for tier two, tier three uh, residents that that might make a lot of sense and they'll be able to win a piece of the marketplace. And obviously the rise of social gaming with uh, platforms like WeChat, Line, Momo. Momo is a, in China is a, started out as a dating platform. I think it means stranger. Um, they're converting it more to, surprisingly, more into a more generic social platform. We, we are building actually a brand new ski safari just for that customized platform. And again, the key message is China is going to reinvent itself again in 2014. So what's next for Ski Safari in China? Um, as a company, we're looking and really focusing on social. So again, this was a Momo customized game for them. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of avatars and social competition leaderboards, um, obviously customized for China, character sets and arts that's very different, um, and more social. So you'll be in, able to invite friends, you'll be able to do social gifting, um, you integrate friends straight into your own gameplay, live tournaments and comp competition with friends. Uh, what you'll discover is that events, driving live events to games is one of the biggest levers in increasing your retention and monetization, uh, particularly with the popularity of CCG games. Um, rare cards given away at weekly events, leaderboards and competitions will really dramatically impact your revenue. So uh, this is really kind of the overview of what's happened. $69 net revenue uh, before we took over the game. Uh, first edition, the Chinese edition, 20x. See a significance in the revenue. The Yoda one produced, this is fully produced Chinese content. And today, 210x the revenue. Uh, that number is actually now closer into the high 20s. Uh, and this again is about 75 million total users. We're able to share a lot of information with you guys um, because Define has given us explicit permission to share data. These are the guys, uh, Morgan Jaffe over at Define down in Brisbane, Australia. So that's it. 30 minutes. Uh, any questions? <laughs> I think there was a gentleman there who wanted to ask a question. Yes. I just had a question about the carrier billing. Yeah. Rev share, what is it typically in China? Uh, it can go as high as about 30, 35%, depends on the carrier. Um, you know, carrier billing is an interesting. Uh, issue because it, it really does create frictionless payment but as I noted the you know Alibaba and Alipay are getting into gaming as they announced and rumor mill has it that Apple is also considering doing carrier billing straight with with their with their iTunes store so if that happens you know that will change the landscape dramatically so you're gonna look at 35% off the top of what uh, uh, you, your revenues would be from the carrier side. And then if you're publishing, obviously, then you have whatever the agreement between the publisher and the developer. All right, um, if you guys have questions for Joan. I guess I'll be in the back. Sorry, I, I just messed up the schedule here. No worries. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs>